Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Learn with Jason. And today on the show, uh, we're bringing back Steve. Steve, how you doing? I'm great. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing. I'm doing so good. I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, I am really excited for a lot of reasons. I mean, I I've loved loved watching your content. You've always got good like short format content on how to get better at at code. Uh, you're building really cool stuff over at Builder. You're doing interesting things with Quick, and I am just taking over your intro. So why don't I before I get this all wrong? Why don't you give us some details on on who you are, what you do? Totally. Yeah. So yeah, I'm co-founder CEO of a company called builder.io. We do some cool, like, you know, AI turn Figma designs to code and there's cool API that can take those designs and just pump them out to your live website. Like take your design for the new home page, just publish, boom, get it off the developer backlogs and into marketing wants to change. Marketing can just do the change. That's the idea. Um, we also make cool open source projects. We're really obsessed with sort of how do we build and deliver amazing stunning web interactive web experiences that are easy to build fast etc right the, the easy can be the visual editing we provide these integrations like figma or can be like building with quick building with astro party town mitosis we make cool stuff <laughs> it's hard as a startup to do so many things but we try our best to do the best job we can with all of it yeah absolutely and and I mean, it's, it seems like you're doing a pretty good job because everything that we see come out feels quality. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, especially there's been a lot of hype around the quick stuff. And I think for good reason, like the, the quick stuff introduced something that I have never seen before the concept of resumability. So, um, if other folks are like me and, and this was a brand new term, do you want to give us a, a quick overview of, of what resumability is? Yes, totally. So for really brief background, you know, one, the way that like I came about to sort of pairing with Mishko and saying like, oh my goodness, Quick is incredible and worth us investing pretty significantly in was when, um, you know, we made this, this builder platform, this way to take like a visual editor and pump it out to code, whatever framework you have. And one thing we noticed was when people see like a drag and drop GUI editor or something, that looks like, a, you know, a, um, People will compare it to very legacy things like Microsoft front page or more modern things like a Webflow or Wix or something. But developers' first impression is generally like that's going to generate poor performing code, you know, buggy or ugly or or it's going to hurt my site performance. You know, I'm a developer, I need to manage that kind of by hand. And so we are very proud. We did all this ridiculous performance optimizations. You know, you drag and drop, make something, but then we will crunch it down to be highly optimal code. And, but what people were doing is they're going to like our website, which was, you know, content generated from the platform. And they'd be like, oh, this is like a, you know, 40 uh, on Google PageSpeed Insights, right? Out of hundred. And they're like, if it's really so fast, why is your sign now faster? And I remember being mm -hmm. like, why is their sign now faster? <laughs> and uh, and then you look around, you're like, why is nobody's site fast? Like if it's at some decent scale, right? It's not just your personal blog or something. And so I was like, well, this is silly. It was it was a React, you know, site, I think using Next.js or, or similar. And um, we're like, well, you know, our tech can pump it out for any framework. So let's try, we plugged in Vue, we plugged in SolidJS, we plugged in Angular. Svelte, all the things. And we were able to run these sort of performance benchmarks, the same exact content written to canonical code of all these frameworks. And like the best we got was with SolidJS and it was like 45. <laughs> so it was like still not like that much higher. Like where's the 100 or 90? I, I take 90. Right. And so, you know, we couldn't figure it out. And so what I did is like, well, we have this cool technology to take like a JSON representation of this, you know, this site, say just our homepage. And we can modify it any weird way. So I can like, you know, it's kind of a pipeline between the, the, conceptual kind of UI and the output code. Let me try messing or hacking away at how we generate output across these frameworks to see what would be fast. And um, eventually, I mean, I was trying everything and like the most I could squeeze out of it was like a 46, I was losing my mind. And eventually I was like, let me get more drastic here. And what I did is I tried a, a few different things. Um, like I tried like, let's just delete all images. Is it images? Let's render the site with no images, see the performance score, eh, not really faster. I tried rendering the site with no CSS, not really faster. And I was like, what about with no JavaScript? It won't function, but let's see. Shot to 99. <laughs> like, <laughs> I couldn't move it like two points. And when I just deleted JavaScript, it was perfectly fast. And like, after a lot of time, I was like, this makes sense. Like, you think that the web page is HTML. You're displaying this kind of, it was a homepage, a static page, right? It had like right. one animation. Like, who cares? Mostly links. But what you're doing is you're rendering this HTML. The HTML is kind of a facade with the the majority of frameworks you know they're out today um barring astro a bit of react server components there's nuance here but really what was out there at that time was like you're downloading all the javascript for that page you're hydrating it all so you're executing and sort of re-rendering the page even though you're not replacing dom nodes and then your site could be interactive and one really interesting insight about this was the fact that 
you know, a lot of our framework benchmarks were very much dependent on, you know, inserting rows quickly, making granular mm -hmm. transitions quickly, and the weight of the framework itself. But what we realized is the weight of the framework kind of doesn't matter at all. It's the weight of how your code loads into your web page. So if you're duplicating all of the code that kind of pre-rendered the page and you're mm -hmm. downloading it again to hydrate client side, especially when it's not even interactive, the majority. Well, of the right. Page, because it, yeah. and like to, to, to like put a very fine point on this, one of the big challenges with hydration is that you are putting all of the data, like every word on the site comes in, in the pre-rendered HTML that is static. And then also, if you look down at the bottom of the, the rendered markup, there's a script tag that's yeah. got this giant JSON object that duplicates oh, yeah. all of that data. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, you're doubling the size of any content on your page just by virtue of doing this hydration, which seems trivial until it's not. And then it's really yeah. not trivial. And like, this is the kind of thing that bit, um, there was that big thing about a government site where they, they, they leaked everybody's social security numbers because they didn't understand how hydration worked. And in their, their, oh, uh, oh. their static builder, they had loaded everybody's data and yeah. then they only rendered the data they needed on the page, but all of the data went in that JSON blob. So somebody viewed source and just started copy pasting out people's identities. So it's, it's a, it's one of those things that, that it's sneaky, but man, does it add a ton of weight to, a page that has to then be parsed and and rehydrated and all of those things. Um, so anyways, I interrupted you, but I, I, I feel like that's an easy one to, to forget if you've never actually viewed the source of one of these hydrated pages. Precisely. Yeah, no, that's spot on. And you can add it up. There's the three layers, the base HTML, which if this was an Astro site, PHP site, quick site, that'd be it. Like that's how you mm -hmm. load. But with hydration, mm -hmm. you're loading the JSON, which duplicates it all. And then you're loading the JavaScript, which is just that HTML in JavaScript form again. <laughs> and then you're executing. It's just, it's crazy. You're loading the same thing three times over. And the JavaScript one's particularly expensive because it's executing a lot on startup. Like you might just want to click on this link and maybe it's a little JavaScript so it can't run until hydration completes. It just, it actually, it was crazy. And so what we did is we're like, okay, you know, maybe some other sites have a solution to this that works. So we took like the top 50 e-commerce sites. E-commerce is a good example of they get complex over time, especially large ones. You know, there's a lot of code. I mean, you developers every day, here's a ticket, add this code and the code base grows. And that means the amount of code downloading on the client, even if not always rendering, tends to grow. Your package dependencies, it just, it gets hard to manage. So we took the top 50 e-commerce sites. Well, also e-commerce is also because um, e-commerce, the industry knows very well that the slower your site is, the more money you lose. Like it's literally just mm -hmm. dollars. One right. second slower is like a billion dollars gone if you're at a certain scale and it's, it's highly measurable. And so they know their sites have to be fast. They're losing money if they're not. And we did, I made this big spreadsheet and I just had, I plugged a bunch of these like top 50 into Google PageSpeed Insights. And like the average score was like 13, right? It was very, very low. And so what we did is we made this kind of like um, CDN proxy where I could load the same site and try a few tests, strip out all JavaScript, strip out all images, strip out all CSS. And we saw the new scores. And on average, I forget the exact numbers, but in the ballpark, when you strip out all CSS, you go up a point or two, strip out all images, you maybe go up five or so points, strip out all JavaScript, the average becomes like 85. <laughs> so it was just this ubiquitous thing. Everybody's downloading way and executing way too much JavaScript client side. And the way that like our frameworks had traditionally worked kind of um, it fed into that. And so, you know, I started playing around with, can we do something crazy and create some custom compilation output target where we kind of generate HTML and little bits of inline JavaScript for the minimal mm. interactivity, right? Skip everything else, the, the redundant data, the redundant JavaScript to download and execution. But I was having trouble figuring out how to scale it. I never made a framework before. I was like making this sort of compilation, whatever framework thing. That was kind of just meant for our platform at first, just to see if it would be um, helpful. And right. then I met Mishko and Mishko's like, hey, I'm working on this thing. He's like, at Google, there's this internal framework called Wiz that powers Gmail, Google search, et cetera. And he uses a very, very clever technique to load only HTML, add these little attributes in the HTML that signify like when you click this, this should execute you know, by paths to where the JavaScript files live. It has a clever prefetching mechanism so that all the bare minimum JavaScript needed will be prefetched but not executed. And they have a comp compilation system that makes sure that like what runs on the client is as delayed as possible, it's as lazy as possible, and it's as granular and minimal as possible. Mm. He said the DX was was brutal. It was on these very legacy Google systems. It's like Java backend and templating was weird and all this stuff. But he's like the runtime execution was like incredible, handled insane scale, insane performance, insane complexity. 
And so he's like, hey, I'm making this quick thing that can bring that, bring this idea of just don't download JavaScript, don't execute JavaScript to any site and make it feel like a modern framework, make it feel like you're writing a React app. And so that's that was the big light bulb. And I was like, hey, I got some data to show you. And he's like, wow. And we hooked quick up to the builder site, score shot up as expected. We tested on a few others and we're like, we're investing. And that was kind of the, right. the, the genesis. Yeah. And, and so the... Um... The general idea here is like we, so to, to, if I can attempt to nutshell this, so the, the challenge is that the way that we've been writing JavaScript has been basically, I would say wasteful. We, we render it on the server, we ship the static markup, we render it into JSON, we ship that as a script tag, and then we send down the JavaScript, which then has to like boot like be loaded, boot on the client side, and then execute everything, update every DOM node, regardless of whether or not it actually needs to do anything, because we have to have that VDOM rebuilt in order, or some representation of the DOM in order to let the JavaScript framework continue to do the thing that it does. So there have been two approaches to this. Quick, as you just described, is basically compiling in line and using attributes and, and a very small runtime to allow things to basically, you don't duplicate data, you're just putting everything into the framework with a way for the that light runtime to immediately start using things. It's, it's as you say, resumable as opposed to hydrated. Um, yes. The other approach that we've seen is the Astro approach. So Astro is taking this sort of just-in-time approach where the vast majority of things on a website don't actually need to be JavaScript at all. You just want to use JavaScript to author them. And what that means is that, you know, I write my React components or my Solid components or my Svelte components, and the Astro framework will compile that down to HTML. But because there's no interactivity on the vast majority of these things, it doesn't bother shipping me a JSON object or a framework to hydrate that thing. It just sends me the thing that needs to be there, which is the, the data somebody needs. So by default, an Astro site sh ships zero JavaScript. There's your 100% performance score, right? Um, but when you need interactivity, you can add an attribute that flags that, and it will bring in the thing that you need just in time. Now, this does reintroduce hydration because you're once you reintroduce the framework, you still have to use the framework. So if you're using React components and you flag one to run just in time, it's not very much React, but that little bit of React still has to ship its JSON object, still has to ship the framework, still has to rehydrate, all that work has to be done. It's just less work. So overall, Astro is getting a big performance, yes. but what if we could do both, right? And I didn't think this was possible. I, I kind of had it in my head that this, these were like fundamentally incompatible concepts. I thought you had to choose one or the other, but can you ship Astro just in time with resumability as the strategy for that interactivity? Yes, 100%. Amazing. So <laughs> this is very, very exciting. So I, I have questions about this, and, and I think I'm, I'm going to try to stick to just a couple questions because I want to spend a lot of time building. But I, I am very curious, how, like, was this hard? Like, did, did this require, because it bends my brain trying to think about how you would do this. So how did you implement this in, in practice? Great question. So uh, first thing, huge credit to Jack Shelton, who's the one who built this out amazing work that he did. I want to call him out super prominently. And so let me explain sort of what, what this required. And so at a high level, at a very conceptual level, we kind of thought similar at first too. We're like, hey, these are both trying to be the, you know, zero jobs by default, very efficient way to dis distribute HTML to a client and load JavaScript minimally afterward, right? So we kind of had a similar thought at first, like, oh, these are different things. And you would use one or the other. We then came to realize actually at the end of the day, you know, Quick is just sending HTML over the wire with a couple special attributes that make the subsequent interactivity very performant, fine-grained, you know, to load. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, Astro is just a way to just write and send HTML. One real amazing part about Astro is there is virtually no magic, meaning if you don't write client-side JavaScript, like you're very aware if you're writing client-side JavaScript, it's going to run client-side or not. You know, there's no ambiguity. There's no like, will RSC load this way or whatever? It's like, hey... By default, none. If you specifically add it, the React component, the inline tag, whatever, that's when it'll run. And the DX is really, really nice across. But because it's a way to just send HTML, at the end of mm. the day, Quick delivers just as these snippets of HTML. In fact, it opens up these interesting use cases like you know micro front ends and the Quick containers or these kind of like encapsulated things. And so 
at a conceptual level, bridging those things across is actually really straightforward. If you're just going to send HTML, the HTML can be kind of quick HTML alongside and aligned with anything else. Now, the reality though is because quick was was originally made as like kind of quick core and the sort of quick city, the layer on top that is a totally separate layer and you can make additional, call it meta frameworks on top of this. It was always kind of intended to be able, but like mm. kind of like all things when you're building and you're just kind of like making things work and you're really like quickly to work with quick city, um, there were lots of things that just like did not, we did not think through on making it compatible, you know, easy to just plug into other places. So that's the hard work that Jack did. I'm like, let me reverse engineer all of this, figure out, you know, it's probably only a specific couple things that need to be made compatible, but digging into that, figuring it out, you know, with the assistance of our team was a serious job, but high level, super simple. Astro pumps out HTML, Quick does too. You can load them together nicely. And it has one really cool surprise attribute, which is um, the DX loading Quick inside of Astro works exactly as you'd expect, as in, you know, you just import Quick component, render it in the sort of Astro um, JSXE style. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't use any of the hydration attributes. You don't use client, you know, load, client visible, any of that. Quick, that's all automated. It's all HTML by default, and it handles the granular, um, you call it almost like micro hydration from there. Micro hydration. I love it. <laughs> I, love, I, I think, I mean, I, one of the things that I, I love about JavaScript and, and I, I say love with, with a massive amount of tongue in cheekness is yeah. the, the stacking of acronyms. It's, in, it's my favorite thing. <laughs> oh goodness, oh goodness. Yeah, don't get me started on that. There were a few times we thought we needed an acronym for the quick something, something, and we're like, you know what? At a certain point, we're like, you know what? Just don't, don't make an acronym, whatever you can do, invent a word if you have to resumable, but just don't make an acronym. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> no, I think, and but resumability makes sense. Like, I I like the idea because, the, and this is something that we have we have talked about a lot is the the idea that you want things to be interruptible. You don't want them to be destroyed yeah. and then rebuilt entirely. You want them to be, you know, you want your your logic to pause and then continue when it's time. Right. This is this is a a big goal. And I just don't know that we'd ever really found a way to crack that in the the server client boundary kind of until here like this this yeah. feels to me like i maybe and maybe i'm wrong maybe somebody can correct me but i don't think i've ever seen anything that does this before this feels like a net new accomplishment in in computer science is this idea that like with quick you get to do some work on the server and then just send the pause state of work to the client and then resume that work as if it was never interrupted on the client side and this has some really interesting things like Y'all have been able to, uh, for example, serialize functions across the server client boundary. That still kind of melt. And I know that that's now, like now that that's out there, I've seen that get introduced into, I think Remix has it and they're figuring it out in React and, and it's, it, but the, how? Like this stuff is so freaking cool. Uh, like, you know, the idea that you can send a promise from the, the server to the client and it doesn't explode is just very, very interesting things are happening in JavaScript right now. And, and I'm really excited to see uh, how we're, you know, as, yeah, as, as uh, Sinani is saying, like, push those boundaries. Like we're, we're really moving the, moving the goalposts in terms of what the most excellent approach is here. And, uh, and, and with that being said, I think, Let's see, is there anything high level that we want to cover before we start playing with code here? Yes, maybe one more actually. I realized Let's there's one it. good metaphor to share regarding how this works. So you you mentioned, and yeah, I didn't go into the details of like where the concept of resumability comes from, but you're spot sure. on that the whole concept is, um, the way Mishko describes it is one of the way our sites are generally built today is they would, um, in his metaphors, you'd call it replayable. So you, you kind of, your application executes on the server, like you were talking about, you then kind of snapshot just the HTML and distributes the client, a bunch of other metadata can be a lot. And then you have to replay that. So you send all the JavaScripts that was used on the server to now recreate on the client. Mm -hmm. The client sort of wakes up with amnesia, has no idea what's going on and has to re-execute everything and hopefully land in the same state it wasn't before. Now our frameworks <laughs> help us to make sure that's the case. Sometimes it's not, hydration errors are a pain. We even released this hydration error modal because it still is a common pain point, but I wouldn't say it's an overwhelming one. That, and, that reminds me very much of, uh, have you seen the movie Memento? 
where like he I wakes up every day and he has to like look at his notes and he's got like all these important facts tattooed on his body oh, I have so that he this. can yes. figure out like yes. what he's supposed to be doing. So totally. so that if you've seen Memento, that's that's yes. uh, replayability. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Wake up every day and have to try and refigure out your whole life. That's what hydration is versus resumability. You know, the opposite is you kind of. Uh, one way Mishka describes it is like how VMs work. So you can load a VM on one machine, pause it, actually in many cases distribute that to another machine and wake it up and you don't reboot the operating system. You just start where you left off. And that's a really interesting in innovation, especially being able to distribute that as just a, a fragment of HTML at a time. And so it's cool that that actually is why it works so well with Astro. And it's why it opens up all kinds of other new possibilities. Like we have people experimenting with you snapshot some state on a server, some state at the edge and some in the clients. Like you can actually, Mishko's got a cool demo where you like open up like a to-do app, fill in some to-dos, and then you grab the HTML from the client, paste it in another browser, and then you actually can interact where you left off. The full state of the to-dos is resumed. All this stuff is Amazing. wild. Yeah, and you might say, people might be watching this and be like, who cares? Like, why do you need that? And it's like, actually, it solves a lot of really interesting, long-running, challenging problems. I'll put it this way. Here's just the last thing to conceptually share, and then we could dive in. One way to look at this is what this enables. It enables a lot of crazy stuff. Um, and, you know, and you're right, there's a lot of interesting under-the-hood work, like not just serializing functions, which some frameworks are now adding, you know, kind of top-level exported functions, but serializing closures. So, like, having a function callback which has, it captures, you know, lexical scope. So it's referencing variables outside of its own scope, but it's able to capture that, serialize it, distribute it over the wire in a super efficient way. Now, why, why we do all this crazy stuff? Like some people have said like, wow, you're just over-engineering the heck out of a seemingly very simple problem. And it's like, I can totally see why it looks that way. But here's sort of the, the way to look at the end result is one way we talk about it as, as you know, this whole kind of current method of, of writing applications is a lot like, maybe a long time ago when you had to download a video in your web browser, you had to download the whole video. <laughs> Once the whole thing was done downloading, you hit play and then you could watch it. Quite an innovation to watching videos online or in any sort of distributed mechanism is streaming. You buffer just a little bit ahead and then you can watch flawlessly without having pre-downloaded the whole thing. And that's sort of what this enables. We call it sort of JavaScript streaming, this idea that you're on one page and then you know we can buffer, we can pre-download little bits of JavaScript and they're all ready to execute as needed. None of it pre-executes, you know, that is all as lazy as we can make it. And that has no negative consequence to performance, which is good. Um, but what's wild about it is the fact that, you know, unlike a video that is linear, there's only, you know, one start and one end, navigating a website is extremely multidimensional. You can go many, many different ways. And that's what this tech actually enables. You have some like out of the box, smart prefetching on how we kind of anticipate user paths and can then only download execute on a very as needed basis. You can configure this, like if you wanna be very offline first, awesome, just crank it all the way up and everything's pre-downloaded, easy peasy. And another thing that is sort of in a lab phase right now is what we call quick insights. What it is, is it's inspired by like, um, Minko Getchev made this really cool thing called Guest.js. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So it looks at Google Analytics for your site and it looks at what the user paths are and then based on that, it'll do smart prefetching. If most people go from your home page to your product page, then they'll prefetch that immediately and it's ready, lightning fast. It's much smarter than what we do today, which is like, oh, if this link is visible on the page, like, great, my menu has 100 links. What right. do people actually click on? It's probably one more than the others. And so with Quick, you actually can plug in a very similar mechanism and then actually on a very granular basis. And most people land on this page and then hit the Add to Cart button. That is pre-streamed and ready immediately. And mm -hmm. you get all this cool stuff. I'll stop rambling about cool stuff and we can actually dive in and look at it together. So I, I just saw a question that I think is good. Um, so Astro does like some page transitions and things. Is quick, does quick work with, with like view transition, view transitions and things like that? It, it seems like the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, view transitions at the fundamental level, the browser feature, yeah, absolutely. And so mm -hmm. uh, a good way to think about it is, um, you know, actually one way to put it regarding quick and Astro is, you know, by default, if you're building with Astro, right, HTML only, like all things, reach for the JavaScript only as needed. Uh, inline JavaScript, if you have very trivial functionality, amazing. And then whenever you get to that point where you're like, ooh, I got, I got some complexity, I'm rendering this like to-do list with like an iteration that needs to update and needs to feel fluid on the client, not be making too many round trips. That's where you could either reach for like a React or, or the analogs, or in this case, if you want to really have top-notch performance while maintaining full complexity of interactivity, uh, a React like DX, but you know everything is kind of client-side rendered and updated to the extent that you need to be very rich and feel nice, 
just reach for quick instead and use it the mm. same way you would. Uh, Bytes called it like react to the good parts at one point because we use like signals instead of, um, you know, states. I really don't like mm. use state or use effects. We use much more like solid JS hook style. So it should feel familiar, but also modern in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for anybody who wants kind of a, a 101 on on how quick works, uh, we've had Mishko on the show talking about quick several times. And so there's a lot of good insight there on the show. Um, actually, why don't I take us over into this view here? Um, and I will actually just pull up a couple links here. So um, let's look at the site. If you go to learn with Jason, you hit command K and you search for quick. You are gonna find, uh, here's something on Quick City, which is the framework for building with Quick. We've got an intro to Quick here. We've got an update on Quick 1.0. Um, and then after, as soon as Steve and I go offline, this one will be available to watch on demand. So lots of Quick content here on, uh, on the Learn with Jason site. So you can make sure that you go and check that out. Um, and then we are talking to Steve. So this is Steve's uh, Twitter profile, you can go and do a follow there. We've got the quick homepage. If you want to go and get those details, uh, here is Astro, which we're going to be doing the combination. And then over here, I've got this page on how to integrate Astro and quick on the, the quick docs. Um, what else? What am I? All right. So at this point, I have I have links to things, <laughs> but I'm not sure how to get started outside of just saying, Steve, what do I do next? Yes. Yeah, let's find the right doc for you. So in this case, I think this is the right one. So scroll down on this page a little bit. We will need an Astro project, and then, yeah, we'll follow the installation, which is really just two steps. So first, Got we should it. probably create from the Astro docs a brand new project, and then we can install quick to it. Okay, so we're gonna npm create Astro at latest, if I can get my keyboard to push <laughs> the right keys. All right. I love Houston. Houston is such a, such a good idea. All right, so we are going to call this one um, quick Astro perf. And should I, do you want me to keep any files or go empty? Uh, it's up to you, either works. Let, let's go empty, we'll just, we'll keep it simple. We'll write cool. TypeScript, we'll keep it strict, new repository, yes. I have to and say, I love that you still use Twitter instead of X. I actually have been hardcore I refusing to use the word X. You know what's weird? Everybody gave me grief about that. So today was the first day I ever said X instead of Twitter. I was talking to you. Won't do and it. I realized you're the first person who also won't do it. I'm like, I'm going back, not saying nope. X. I can't. Oh, I'll, I, I'll tell you what, I, I, that. Yes. I will call it X when they make it good again. <laughs> when it's good again. <laughs> <laughs> I will join that pack 100%. <laughs> like, I, I know I'm being grumpy about this, but also, like, that was, it was my favorite place, and now it's sad. Yeah, yes. Uh, okay, so here we go. We're in this, uh, I'm not going to do that right now. Let's close that up, and all right, I've got, uh, I've got my site. So this is a, a bog standard Astro site. All we have in here is, um, let me make this a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on. I'm gonna close this down. Uh, this is basically all we've got. We've got our Astro config, which is empty. Um, we have our package JSON, which has just the bare basics that we need to make Astro work. And we've got this one Astro file, which has no Astro features in it outside of sharing what version of Astro you're using when you publish the site. Okay. Cool. so. From here, I want to add quick. There you go. So I'm yeah. gonna keep this open and it looks like we've got some some deals here. And I think I even saw uh, Elian from the, the Astro team was saying that there's even a, an Astro command for this. So we can, oh, oh is it's, there? yeah, this is it. This is it right here, NPX Astro oh, add. Oh, yes, correct. So exactly. here we go, I'm gonna grab it. And this is my this is my favorite thing about Astro. I think this is so clever. Mm -hmm. So I I've gone to add this, and it says, "Do you want to install all the dependencies? So not just the the Quick Dev thing, but like, hey, we need we need Builder Quick. We need the right version of TypeScript. Okay, great. Yeah, let me install. Do you want to update your config? Here's the code we're gonna add. God, this is a yeah. good. It's just a good experience. All right. And so now if we go back out and we look here, and I open up my config. We're done. We're configured. It's in there. 
Yep. I love you, Astro. <laughs> <laughs> There is one last step, and I actually wonder, okay. we should ask Jack this. There's, I wonder why we don't do it automatically. I have a guess as to why we don't do it automatically, but scroll down just a little bit. We need to update our TypeScript config. I'm guessing we're nervous about doing that. If we're not super high confidence, we're doing the right thing. But yeah, we want to make sure the JSX definition matches. Uh, if you're using TypeScript, I think most people do and should. It matches the uh, JSX import source that Quick needs. Where is my T? Here's my TS config. Okay, it was there. I was trying to type. TypeScript. All right, so let's add the compiler options and can stick that right there. Good, good. Yeah. That okay. should be it. Now, when you scroll down a little further on the doc, it'll give us a component we can copy paste in. Um, go a little, there we go. Adding so the component we'll further thing. down, sorry. Ignore that. There oh, we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go, okay. Yeah, so now we can grab that code just as an example. It's not pretty, it's just a button with text inside. Got um, it. And then we can create a new file. So you can add a file called source components counter.tsx or whatever, and then paste it in. We can import it. Okay, so here's our counter.tsx, and I'm going to copy this component here. Yes. And let's just take a quick second to let's make this bigger. I'm going to hide this, close this down, and let's just look at what a, a basic quick component looks like. So things that are really familiar to me, um, it's the capital C counter, so it looks like a component the way I'm used to. We're returning JSX, so just, you know, return the markup that I want to use. And a lot of the rest of this looks fairly familiar, but a little bit different from what I've seen. So I'm, you know, if I want to put a value in, I put it in curlies, just like in React. I'm, I've got some functions here. Um, this use signals got like a hook vibe, but it also has the solid like signal vibe. Yeah. Um, I can see the dot value is very signally. Um, any any specific notes here? Like, I, there's a couple things that I've never seen yes. before, like the dollar sign here uh, attached to a couple things. Is that to make it very clear that you're using a quick feature, or is there is there another reason? Great question. Yeah, so the dollar is really really critical here. So you're right. So the um, the hooks and signals works most similar to Preact. So okay. Solid is really unique in that you don't ever rerun component functions, you know, ever, as you're probably familiar. So you don't use things, you create things, kind mm -hmm. of pushes that point that we're creating this and it's done, it's there, which is a really cool feature of it. Um, in our case, we actually found Preact's approach to be the most elegant for quick in that you have maybe a closer balance to what you expect from React with the benefits of signals. And so that was mm -hmm. one of our probably closest inspirations here. And then you also have stores, which are like, recursive. So if you have a products list and that whole thing needs to be observed, if it updates, anybody who renders from it needs to get, you know, a re-render or a granular patch that happens automatically. So actually view is a close comparison here too. I mean, in our opinion, taking the best of what we've seen and most kind of fitting for the framework, but the dollar sign, that's the most important thing here. So we talked about, you know, we can serialize all these crazy things. We can serialize a closure. We can serialize a signal, a promise, a function, or whatever. So the dollar sign is something you'll see throughout Quick. You can see it. We wrap components in component dollar, and we also for the event hands or the on click that ends with a dollar as well. What that mm -hmm. does is it signifies to our compiler. Um, so it's a special sort of token. Anything that ends with a dollar sign is something that our compiler and other tools are aware of as what we call a serialization boundary. So what that means is um, anything that crosses a dollar sign. So a good example would be that counter variable is outside the dollar sign when defined and inside the closure of, you know, of the dollar sign um, when referenced. That is a serialization boundary. So something you cannot do here would be to, I'm trying to think of like a weird example. Now we can serialize so many things, it's actually hard to come up with an example. Um, I don't know if I can off the top of my head, at least something that makes sense. Um, what is like a Node.js specific API? Actually, that's a good example. Let's say you, here's a silly example. Let's say at the top of this file, you did like import FS from FS, like you're importing mm -hmm. Node.js specific libraries. And then if you did that, you tried to reference it inside the onClick function, both during static analysis, during ES lint phase, we'd say like, oh, you can't do that. Oh my goodness, I've got the, <laughs> you know what's crazy? This Mac thing, like balloons will appear. You have to disable it like per application. And I guess it's, I haven't disabled it for Chrome yet. It is atrocious. Like I, it, it is very funny though, because if you, once you find it, if I can, where is it? Hold on, let me get back. Cause you can, then you can start turning them on just by like, 
hey, let's do a. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do this? It, it's like up in that the little green camera thing, and then you can drop yeah. down the the cameras and just start like doing effects. And oh, it's. Oh, I, I see. There it is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely so, ridiculous, but hey, why not? Um, I was in a board meeting one time on Zoom. I love one of the best <laughs> benefits post pandemic is that I can join board meetings and wearing sweatpants. Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is remote. It's amazing. Um, but I was in a board meeting one time. We're having like this very serious discussion, very difficult. And out of nowhere, like the balloons came up on somebody's camera. Oh, and it was geez. like everybody's trying not to laugh. But <laughs> there was like the worst possible timing. Um, we don't even know why. I don't even know what they did. But anyway. Um, so, um, the, we will statically analyze that, like, like this is important for many things for performance, for certain kind of security, safety, all the stuff. Um, you can't take, for example, like no JS APIs and shoot them out to the clients, right? We will not allow mm -hmm. that. That, that would be absurd. You know, don't do that. <laughs> Even if it could be done, don't do it, please. Um, <laughs> and the dollar sign is a way for us to make clear anything that would, anything that crosses a dollar sign could go from server to clients. Um, there are ways to also add some additional guarantees. We have this server dollar function and, and stuff like that. Um, but in this case, that just tells you, the human, the compiler at uh, sort of parse and, and check time, like lint time, as well as the compiler at compilation time, how we're going to shred this code up to be distributable. And as long as you only know one rule, if there's a dollar, things have to serialize to get over it. And again, the tooling will tell you. As soon as you do something that won't work, we'll tell you, we'll tell you why. Uh, for the most part, you don't got to think about it. In this case, you don't have to think about it in the majority. Yeah, you don't really think about it. Yeah, got it. Okay, so we've got a basic counter. Um, I have, let me see, let's let's look over here. Yeah, so it. then it. Yeah. I've got my, my index here. And then I believe I can do the thing that I always do, which yep. is just import this right from my components counter and it should just auto complete for me it does there we go and then down here i'm gonna put in my counter and i'm gonna intentionally do it wrong to start so uh here's my counter i've put it in yes yes and then i'm gonna run the site npm run dev and that starts me up on 4321 so let's go over here and let's open up 4321 and here is our Astro site. So this is the, the Astro part. And then here's our quick component. And what the hell? <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to catch that. Whoa, yeah, 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 hold yeah, yeah, up, yeah, yeah. hold up. OK, <laughs> this is magic because check out what just happened. In Astro, to make something dynamic, you are supposed to have to include a client directive because Otherwise, you're doing a bunch of unnecessary hydration, but <laughs> we're using resumability, folks. Apparently, it doesn't matter, and it just works. That is freaking dope. So, all right, talk to me about this. Does this... Yeah. <laughs> did, did, like, did I accidentally load a bunch of JavaScript that I didn't need to load uh, with this approach? Great question. So um, that's a beautiful thing. And in fact, it was funny because that surprised me too. I was like, wait a second, we did something wrong. And then I realized, no, we didn't actually, we did it right. So here's a way to think about it. And I'll describe in more detail. The way to think about it is, in my opinion, Astro is the best framework for creating HTML first applications to distribute to clients, right? I love, love, love that it's sort of like the awesome modern PHP we never had, right? Mm. Everything works beautifully. DX is beautiful. Inline script tags can compile to transpile. Like all the little things we all know is incredible. What Quick does is gives you the ability to also distribute um, resumable HTML. You can call it magic HTML or whatever you want to call it. I, I refrain from using the word magic, but it's a little magical in this case. So the HTML, why don't we inspect it? Um, if you open your browser dev tools and click on that button, we can show you some interesting stuff. Now, the original version of Quick, things were prettier. Our compilation got more optimized and things are less pretty, but we'll still see the key thing. So the big thing to see, yeah, is that on-click attributes. Uh, in dev mode, there's some other junk we add that is, not, is stripped out in production, but that's the magic right there. So on click, when we distribute this HTML, it has this path to, that's actually a path to a JavaScript file. Um, it doesn't say .js at the end. It used to because, you know, it's sort of a convention, but don't actually need that in reality. So mm -hmm. that's the path of JS. It also could be just called, you know, slash, you know, hash.js. The one thing we do do 
is if you ever use a quick component on a page, we will add one little small snippet of JavaScript as a global bootloader. We only load it one time, regardless of the amount of components. There we go, that's a quick loader. And this is the dev mode version. It's even smaller in production. This is why in, we sometimes, now this is a bit pedantic and, and not entirely accurate if you really want to go deep on the perfect use of this term, but we call this generally speaking an O of one framework, meaning no matter how complicated your site or application is, no matter how big it grows, that's all the JavaScript you will ever load. And all the JavaScript does is two things. The most important thing is it listens for, if you click an element that has an on click in it, it will find the path of the file, it'll import and execute that one specific file granularly. And second, it'll prefetch. It'll scan for those things and anything it sees, it'll, in a kind of a smart way, prefetch those things. So in reality, what's happening is, the bootloader runs and it looks mm -hmm. for all those on click and on whatever attributes and it finds us past the JavaScript and it, it prefetches those and it actually uses a uh, service worker for that. So we could do it in actually a smarter, more optimal way. And then when you click on that button, it's going to then import that JavaScript file in normal ECMAScript fashion. And that file will already be in your browser's cache. So it loads immediately and I'll execute it. So no JavaScript executes on load besides this tiny bootloader, no matter how large your application is. And as you interact, tiny, tiny things execute automatically. The compiler just does this for you. You just pretend you're writing React for the most part, and then we will take care of all that. So you're not writing inline JavaScript, wiring it up and all those nuances. That is extremely cool. Um, and then I'm I'm looking down here to see. So ah, like, yes. here's a, a, little, a little more happening, but like, look at what's yes. actually happening here. It's, it's not very much. Yeah, I think um, some of these might be and dev only as well. Is this, this is this also what happened when I click? Let me reload. And I, I want to look to see what's happening here. Okay, so we've, we've got this. We've got our quick loader. And like, it is pretty impressive that you can fit your entire framework, including dev mode, <laughs> onto one screen. Yeah. Um, and so then we've got some refs here. And when I go to click one of these, we'll see... It won't update. We won't like synchronize the update back. That's just for the sort of like handoff, so to speak. I gotcha. I gotcha. Uh, there actually is a utility to write it back. That is useful in the cases where, let's say you were doing something where the server generated some HTML and then mm. the edge picked it up and modified it and continued. Oh, At I gotcha. the edge, you would actually write back. That piece makes it sort of distributable over a wire, so to speak. How we used to do it is we used to do inline attributes everywhere. So in the old way, the quick, um, the button itself would actually hold on to its own state. Uh, but the JSON format, actually, the tiny JSON turned out to be more optimal for this. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the, by comparison, like, um, if we look at, what's a, what's an easy example for like a, I'm trying to think of a next site that's not me just picking on the Vercel team directly. <laughs> um, I, let's just pick on the Vercel team correctly. So if we, if we look down at the bottom here, you're gonna find, the the next data which will be where is it boy there's a lot in here um oh, am i going to be able to find this if i it's like next data with the app router they may not use next data anymore they use oh, lots of script tags i think i think that's to support streaming chunk by chunk so you kind of have to add it all oh i got yeah. it i got it i got it. okay so then that's not going to be a good example i whatever it doesn't matter so the the general idea is that you get um you get a lot of, of extra stuff down in the bottom and that, that JSON yeah. object is, is big. It's a, a, a hefty, a chonky boy. Um, exactly. So it's kind of nice also, to not know that I have to worry about that. Exactly. And there's also one point that came up in the chat that's really good, which was um, if the JavaScript is prefetched by a worker, like what happens when you have a big JavaScript chunk? Uh, is there a limit to prefetch to not hurt loading times? And this is actually a really important point worth calling out is that prefetching, so running in a service worker and downloading JavaScript is, um, in terms of all user kind of experience metrics, all Lighthouse metrics, it's literally free. <laughs> Meaning, mm. if we wanted to, we could just download in the background infinite JavaScript. Now, obviously, that'll hog some resources, and sure. the service worker lets us be smart about that and, and prioritize. Um, but that's sort of the beauty here. Let's imagine a scenario, excuse me, where um, you've got a, a page, a web page, and one component on the page is actually extremely heavy. Um, it's got a lot of clients of JavaScript, and let's say, for some reason, there's no avoiding it. Like it's WebGL, there's no way to pre-render any of it. It's all got to load in the clients. Um, 
in the typical sort of like React, et cetera, way, um, we would have to download all that, execute all of it before any of the sort of site itself is interactive at all. You're paying quite an upfront penalty and it does affect the user experience, the lighthouse metrics we use to closely approximate the user experience and all of that. In the case of, let's say it's a quick site, what will happen is the HTML will go to the client and all of that work, a very, it's much less work to do and it all happens on another thread entirely. So it's all mm. free. This component up here, you could be interacting, do all kinds of stuff while this component down here is still prefetching, downloading, getting ready to be interactive. In a, say, a React site, that's not the case. Now they're trying to do things to kind of get closer to that state, but Quick is in many ways, we had the fortune of not having like an existing ecosystem to support. Now there's a downside of that. When you're building with Quick, you're using a much newer ecosystem, which much, much newer packages for many things, and won't have as many things yet. But the huge benefit is we didn't have to support anything. We could actually say, what is the most extremely optimal way? Mm. And you might say like, well, do we have to be so extreme? When you look at a site as complex as Amazon or Google or Apple or Microsoft, you know, whatever, these things start to really, really, really add up. And so this extremely high bar, this sort of idealistic compilation, execution, resumable strategy, it may be something that in this tiny, tiny website, doesn't make a huge difference. It's not a, that big of a deal on the first Hello World, you know, mm -hmm. page that you make. But as your app gets bigger, as you add more engineers to a project, and as things inevitably get beefy, <laughs> they get very, very complex. There's a lot of code added every day. You know, you probably have tickets every day asking for added code, and you probably never get a ticket in the queue that's going to lead to removing code. We want to be able to feel fast today and fast at huge scale, and just never have to worry about it, and just feel good, be a joy to build with, regardless. Right. Yeah, I think that is a it's a good point. And like, I don't know, I, I like the the sort of pragmatism there of of just recognizing that, like, sure, if we had infinite time and, and no, no outside directives, we'd all write clean code all the time. But that's just not the reality is that most code yeah. bases become append only. And yes. so how do you make sure that an append only code base doesn't become unmanageable? Or if it becomes unmanageable, it's only unmanageable for the devs and not for the users. Um, yes. That that is a, a form of thinking that I I think I think we we fall into a trap as devs that we're like, well, I'll have time, I'll make time for this. This one's going to be different. I'm going to make sure that I I carve out the maintenance hours with with leadership and like you can do it for a while, but it's not a it's not a sustainable battle like that it's you you got to be thinking about all right what happens when everybody gets lazy because they've got other things they got to worry about and, and how can we make sure that still gets good results oh totally and it's funny because you could say i mean i remember i was working on my last job and like you know i feel that everybody has at least a moment of thinking this way i'll have moments where i'm like if i ran this company you know we would we have the cleanest code base we would everything be perfect you know this would be so maintainable we build everything so fast because you know the bar was so high and then um you start your own startup and you realize customers need stuff and they need it right now they don't need it in a month after the refactor they need it they literally they need it right now and like your opinion starts to change and you start to realize like okay there's a balance here and maybe the think... people were right one of my favorite one of my favorite things is when uh, like you see somebody who is early in their career and they go you know like oh, I you know if I could just get rid of these idiots in charge and then you meet them five <laughs> years down the road and they're like they're like I'm the idiot in charge and I realize that I was <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes hundred percent there's a good um, oh my god there's this guy there's this guy on TikTok I actually don't know his name I'm it's one of the probably few tech TikTok creators I don't know I should probably reach out to but he has these like um, he he also does improv and he has this um, mm. character he does where he's like uh, Jerry the intern or something and where Jerry will get in the code base and be like I don't know what all this garbage is we're just gonna delete 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 you know delete, delete, delete this, push the prod a bunch of junk code I'll refactor it I'll add a couple packages to handle this and it's like yeah that is the impression you have jumping into a code base until like crushing reality of the world destroys you and the people who have to deliver that who might be the leadership they might not be entirely the bad guy. The bad guy is just the world. The world is hard. <laughs> the customers need things. Business has to make revenue. And you, it's just a thing. It's how the world is. And no business has this solved. In fact, one thing I've learned in the builder journey is we work with lots of companies, really great ones, really awesome logos people think highly of. All of them think that all their software is garbage and everybody else's software must be really good. You know, like, how do they do it? Like, they're good. And I'm like, oh, they're not good. <laughs> they're wondering how you're doing it because they think they suck and you're doing it. You must be doing it right. Turns out nobody's doing it right. Everybody sucks. And that's life <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, so true. Um, okay. So, so 
I want to make sure that we that we take advantage of the fact that I've got you here, and I want to try a couple things that sound hard and see right. how hard they actually are. So, yeah. so here's my here's my thought. One of the big things that Astro promises is this islands architecture, where I can take multiple multiple components, I can spread them around my site, and only the pieces that are interactive are actually going to rehydrate. So, something interesting already happened here, where when I embedded a a counter component from Quick. I didn't have to add one of these client directives to get it to be interactive. So it is already, we're using resumability, not hydration. So we're not paying that hydration toll. So step two then, something that's hard in Astro is what if I want my islands to talk to each other? So what is the process if I want to have my counter button also inform something over here. So let me let me maybe just uh, try out my my quick my quick skills here, and I'm going to say uh, we're we're just going to have like info.tsx. And what I want here is I'm going to export const uh, info, and that's going to be a component. Yep. And that component has a render function that's going to return um, for now. We'll say info goes here. Yeah. <laughs> And let's see if I think that might be enough for me to get this on the page. So I'm going to come down here and say info. And then we will uh, import info from our, oops, I'm, I swear I know how to type info. <laughs> You're I think I, doing so much did I screw coding. something up. Okay, here's our info go. goes here. Um, yeah. So what I what I want to happen is I want when I click this button, maybe this just says the button has been clicked, whatever the count is times. Totally. C can I do that? How would I do that? Yeah, let me explain how you do it today. And there could be even more kind of um, deeper integration with Astro to add more affordances in the future. But today, as long as you're okay with having a parent component, that's also in Quick. We can easily okay. share those across and then communicate across. And that's kind of an important thing. That's actually kind of why Quick takes the approach of being a, um, I guess you would call it full featured framework, like not purely meta, not purely HTML delivery, but full on signals, interactivity, hooks, all that good stuff. So why don't we, for now, we can make a parent components and okay. we can structure this a couple ways, but let's just make a parent component. And um, yeah, we can create a, um, trying to think there's, there's so many ways we, could, ways we could do this we could create a store we pass down we could create a context that gets referenced um context could be a nice way to do it or sure. actually the store as well let's start with a store we'll, we'll take the concepts kind of one at a time okay. so name your component whatever we'll define a store and, and do something fun we'll with just, it we'll go with the old classic wrapper yeah oh in fact yeah i think this will actually be a good a good example okay and so then um do i need i need to do a fragment yes. to do yeah okay it's plain all so we'll put our counter and we're going to put in our info component okay and then i'm going to go back out to my page i guess it's index and i'm going to swap these out for we'll call it wrapper and we're going to put our wrapper here oh i screwed it up uh components wrapper it's a name differently or, or oh uh, i named it parent. that's right that's ah, right. okay ah. so now everything is kind of back to normal but we've got our our wrapper and if i go back into my parent.tsx i'm ready what happens next yes so why don't we do this why don't we do something fun a cool property of signals and why don't we actually just lift the count tracking signal of the counter up to the parent so we can okay. just copy const counter yeah and then we can go back and paste it. We'll deal with how we pass it down in a moment. Beautiful. Okay, Import so then signal. I need my use signal. Okay. Beautiful. And now, yeah, why don't we just pass count signal equals counter or whatever, count equals counter, whatever you like. Yeah, let's do count equals counter. Cool. And then let's go to counter and let's, um, in fact, yeah, why don't we, we could do something fun, actually. We can make the count button just say, you know, click me or something, and then make the, you know, the other component display the count. So in this one, uh, first thing we want to do is, yeah, exactly. So why don't we define, so we want to have a prop. And so mm -hmm. we say like 
you know, you could say like props colon, and then we can provide the types. You could provide the types other way. Yeah. And say counter good uh, or counts. And then uh, there's a signal type exactly uh, in the, um, I don't know what you call it, the alligator brackets number. Mm -hmm. Props counter. Perfect. Counts. Does that and just then, work? Uh, it does, though. Signal right now will assume in any type. If you do signal and pass the type argument of number, it will be number. But yeah, it should just work. Sick. Yeah. And then we could go back to your other component, pass okay, the signal so it's the not, same it's way. Not, no errors, at least. Like we took exactly. out the, the part where we're showing. Let's see. Here's. Oh, wait. Did I? I did. I do, I do have an error. Hold on. Let me reload. Uh, and maybe it was just because I. Oh no, it doesn't like this. What doesn't what doesn't it like? Props dot count of value. Oh, I know what it is. Go back to the other components, um, the parents. We are not passing this as. Oh, we are passing this count. Count counter. Uh, can you hop back for me one more time? We could try logging props dot count. Why is count not being passed through? Count value plus, plus. Yeah. Props dot count. This might come um, on the server. This is the whole resume with it. Well, if you hit click me, it should it should log. Or maybe not actually. Yeah, this is actually a funny case. Let me explain one brief thing. Um, this is an important thing to know. Just adding a console log there, because Quick is resumable, that function body doesn't run on the client ever. So that console log oh. props will only ever run on the server. This is the compiler magic that's running. And so what we actually should probably do is put the log inside of the onclick. Yeah, the onclick dollar is what says, we're not going to send the whole components to the client. We're only going to capture what's inside the click handler and only send that. Exactly. There's, okay, so we got our proxy. Try doing props.count just in case it's a proxy unwrap and, and we can see what's going on here. Undefined. Okay. Props.count is undefined. And then our parents, maybe we can log something in our parents to see what did we do here. This seems, I'm sure this is the most simple thing in the whole entire world that's just escaping us. One thing we could also do that might be interesting is we can add the finishing code to pass this into info as well. We can also consider switching this to a, a context, maybe whatever kind of foot gun we're hitting or whatever kind of tiny typo we're hitting wouldn't uh, affect us with context for whatever reason. But we can also try and flesh out this code further. Maybe we'll learn something by when we hook this into info. Sometimes you have that aha, like, oops, we did one silly thing wrong. But if you want to go to info, we can follow the same pattern and have it log out the counts. Okay, so we want props, and that is going to have, uh, we'll call it the count. Yeah. And that is a signal number. Yep. Okay. And on this one, we want count.value. Whoops, stop that. We want props.count.value. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, and that... See if any magic happens. I'm doubtful. See, it, imag it immediately fails. So we're doing something. Something's oh. going wrong here. Yeah, what's showing up on your server? This is what I'd hope for. We get a new error of some kind. Make sure promises. Okay. 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 Unhandled rejection. Unhandled Converting rejection. circular structure to JSON. Okay, so we're we're trying to serialize something that's not serializable. It looks like. Yeah. Uh, render to static markup, cannot read property of undefined. Okay, that's already interesting. Yeah, so, so that's similar. So it's running into this at this point as well. Um, jump back to your wrapper really quickly, maybe. Let's see if there's just like some typo on how we're defining signal. Why don't we do this? Why don't we switch this over to context? Oh, actually, oh, actually, this will explain it. We need well, to that add. makes sense. We didn't ah, actually. There we go. Yeah. All new right. error here. Okay. Okay, we get the same error perhaps, or did we get any error? Structure error? I don't know. Hold on, let me just old? let me just start this one more time. Make sure we're getting. Yeah, good call. Are you doing anything? Are you frozen? <laughs> okay. It's just yeah, it's just not doing anything. No errors. Yeah, we're just not doing anything. We don't know why. Oh, now it's trying something. Hold on, it's oh. Did my stuff freeze? I don't know. Okay, some of the tab. But now oh. it's just working. Okay, no, I no, think no. I think I locked it up somehow because that <laughs> looks like it wasn't reloading. Oh yeah, it's it's logging the oh 
Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. Um, so that's definitely what happened. For some reason, something got frozen here. And so it was just never passing the props.count through. It wasn't getting this okay. update. So, so I, I locked something crazy. up. Everything is fine. We have working components. Yeah. And whatever we did uh, had nothing to do with the software. We just <laughs> we probably logged something wrong or I got, I think I might've gotten the console caught in the loop because this is like full frozen. I can't, I can't even oh. like close this tab. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so frost or something. Yeah, just bust bug. It. I was gonna say. Anyways, there's a special bad luck that happens when live streaming. That's guarantee something will fail in a way that you'll never be able to re reproduce ever in your entire life. Okay, but so here's the other thing that I was interested in. So yeah. um, I I'm gonna add just some some extra crap in here that is not interactive because I want to yeah. look at what happens. Do we yeah. have a lorem? Can I just do like a lorem? Yeah. All right. What? Is that building VS Code? Do you have an extension? I for think that? it's an Emmet That's thing. Cool. Wait, what did what? I do wrong? Oh, here yeah, it is the extra. Yeah, that's built in. Yeah. Oh, okay. that might have been. Do you have uh, GitHub Copilot on? No, no, no. This is uh, this is a. Okay. Uh, it's Emmet. What? Well, that's awesome. So there's that's there's some nice right? stuff. And it just comes with VS Code, I think. E I think it's on by wow. default. Yeah, I might have I might have installed it early on. There's a few that I like add every time, but um. So there's one funny thing you can do here. If you wanted to comment out the couple components and signal, what you'll see is no JavaScript is distributed again. So kind of, I think what you're looking for is get rid of all the interactive stuff. And then you should not see the quick loader. You should not see the really anything, or maybe we still load the quick loader in dev mode, but in production mode, those things just would not be sent at all. Let's, okay, I mean, let's, let's build, let's see. Sure. So NPM run build. No errors, everything is fine. Then I'm gonna npm run serve. Wait, is that, that's not a thing, is it? So it's npx uh, serve, and then is it dist? Yeah. Okay, so I have localhost 3000 now. And if I open this up, Let's all right. So this is our production site. Yep. And. Oh, do we have quick loader? Oh, never quick loader shows up. That is I a if ticket I... that is not solved yet then, I think. I know it's either done by now or coming soon. But that's okay. sort of the expectation that the customer should have. This is still in beta. I would say by V1, that should be there as well. Because that's the default quick behavior with Quick City and other things too. Got it. But it is, we don't see much of anything here. Um, it's all good. And if we look at the network size, we're, let me turn off the cache. Let me, uh, let's, you know what? Let's play even more. Let's go slow 3G. Oh, yeah. And. Nine and a half kilobytes of resources, even including the. Yeah, there should the be no loader. JavaScript downloaded. So none of the, none of the JavaScript for the components, literally none of that. So it looks like quick loader still there. Uh, Jack mm -hmm. said you might need to run um, a preview build as opposed to, uh, I don't know. There might be a different way we need to do it, but the expectation you should have, at least by 1.0, is yeah, when you're running the production build, no quick loader, but the thing that is working as expected, which, you know. NPM uh, run preview? I don't know what NPM. I forget the difference. This is a V thing, I'm pretty sure. Um, I've run into this with multiple V projects. I've never known the difference. I just know in the case of like Astro or Quick City, I just use. Um, deployment adapters. <laughs> so if I mm. deploy to Netlify or whatever, it just works. It just does the right things. Cool. Okay. I don't know what, I don't know what preview is. Um, turning it off and turning it back on would solve problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so previews the build. Okay. I okay. mostly understand what that means. Good, good, good. So we've what got is build commands. This is because it fuses me in V uh, projects in general. I think it's a common thing. Yeah. But okay, so anyway. so this is good. We're 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 good. We're happy. I'm I'm in. Cool. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Paul, uh, Paulie is saying there's it's in the the package JSON, which obviously it just worked when I ran it. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, do these deployment adapters work going directly to AWS? I believe there is a good. like there should yeah. be Astro adapters for just about everything that you would want. Yes. If we look at the deployment, where is it? 
Yeah, and that's actually a really nice thing. One of the really nice things about the combination of Quick and Astro is when we adapt Quick to work with Astro, now every feature of Astro, where you can say virtually every will just work. Every deploy adapter, Quick City's nope. got a bunch, but probably doesn't have as much as Astro. Um, every, whatever other feature you have on here, you basically give, like, if you want all the things, all the perf and all the features, this is a pretty awesome combo. Where's the actual deployment thing? SSR adapters, maybe official adapters, um, community maintained adapters. So, all right, here's here's the thing I was looking for. So, yeah. um, Node, Vercel, Cloudflare, Netlify, Dino, SST, Bun, AWS. Oh, S SST is AWS too, or SST supports AWS. Oh yeah. So oh, but there's a deploy your site to AWS. AWS. Yeah. Um, there's another AWS. More AWS. So it looks like there there are lots of options out here for what you what you can do. Astro WordPress, that's fascinating. All um, AWS. Oh, yeah. what the heck? <laughs> cool. So yeah, lots and lots of options. Let me drop a link here for anybody who wants it. Um, lots of good stuff there. So all right, let's let's dig back into. Is this my frozen one? No, this one's fine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's let's take this. Make this a little bit bigger so I can get to it. I'm going to close this. Oh, wait, we're in the preview still? Yes, maybe. Yes, so let me get back into dev mode. All right, and then I can uncomment, uncomment. Yes, and, and we'll get a little bit of JavaScript prefetched now. And it should be, this is the cool part. In fact, let's look at the network tab. This will be fun. Dev mode is not as optimized as production mode, but we'll still see, I think, some of the most important things. Um, we're going to preserve, we're going to turn off the log. We're going to disable the cache and then I'm going to yes. run this. So these I think oh, are yeah. the Astro bits. So oh, probably for the, uh, that preview widget. Yes. Yeah. Let me, um, let me Toolbar. just filter out for like Astro. Oh, whoa. You can type dash in a, a negative filter. What? Mm hmm. I think I, I learned this one okay. from like Tim, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Tim, uh, the per, like perf lord, Tim. <laughs> oh, um, yes, I know you're talking about. I forget his last name too, but yes. Hold on, we can find this fast. Uh, Tim, uh, Cadlick. What is it? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, uh, that's a yeah. that is a Tim special. Also, this episode is dope. If you if you're into performance, like get in there. Oh, I buy it. Um, yes. All right, here, so here's a question. What's the difference between Quick City and Astro? Yeah, great question. And so um, and I'll point out, click on that JavaScript file too. We'll open that in a second. Or sorry, the bottom one, chunk, yada, yada, yada. Let me see if this is what I expect. Um, what is this? Sorry, we'll get back to that. So yeah, big difference between Quick City and Astro. Think of it as you have, um, you have SvelteKit, which is sort of like the meta framework built by the Svelte team for kind of Svelte top to bottom everywhere. And then you have Astro where you can load Svelte components, use Astro as sort of the root renderer, AKA the meta framework. So in this case, QuickCity is, is analogous to SvelteKit. It's one great starting point for building quick apps. And then Astro is, is the analog in this case to Astro with Svelte or Astro with Quick. It's another great starting point for kind of the container for your application or the kind of root HTML, the meta framework, whatever you want to call it, the thing that delivers the stuff. Or rather, you could call it this way, the structure of how you write your code, right? Dot Astro files, dot Astro project, Houston CLI versus quick. You'll make all your files as TSX files, similar to React, load in the still sort of HTML first way as mm -hmm. it kind of anticipates. Um, and yeah, you can kind of pick your poison. I think for everybody, a different uh, combination is right. If you love Astro and you just wanted sort of a React style DX for heavy interactivity, but without the perf drawbacks, fantastic. If you're just diehard quick, up, down, left, right, everything quick, you know, you've got quick tattooed on your shoulder, <laughs> quick city is maybe the way to go. Okay, so I figured out uh, what was going on and cool. it's the best possible use case. I hope that jackhammer next door is not coming through my mic right now. Sorry about it's not, that, everybody. It's not. <laughs> um, At least for me, it's not. But check this out. So here, right? Watch what. Watch the network tab when I click. Did you see that? That's cool. Oh yeah, and this is the file I want to show. Yes. So. 
two cool things here. I'm really glad you pointed out. So one worth noting, in development mode, we will only fetch on interaction. In production mode, we'll pre-fetch ahead of interaction and only execute on interaction. But this is the thing I want to show. So you know I was talking about. So actually, let's go to your counter component. We can look at these two things side by side. So in counter.tsx, there we go. So you know how I said that on click handler, when you mm -hmm. click, we're only going to send the click handler. That's what we're seeing here. So this is, and this is actually, this is kind of a big secret, by the way. Um, we talked about how we can serialize. So we, we were the first to serialize functions, serialize promises, serialize stuff across sort of web worker and server client boundaries, like all that stuff. It was very kind of new in quick land. And to be honest, in the beginning, we didn't know if this stuff would be possible. We're like, wait, you can't. And then honestly, Manu on the team would just go away for a week and come back and be like, you can, <laughs> here's how. <laughs> and, uh, and then you see the stuff propagate. We kind of proved the idea. Then it starts showing up in other frameworks, Remix Solid. Um, Ryan Cardiato is a brilliant engineer and reverse engineer. So actually, and mm. we ship, if it can be done in Solid, it will be done in Solid as soon as humanly possible. Not humanly, really, <laughs> but like, he'll make it happen at a quite uh, 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 an amazing cadence. But one thing that's completely unique to us still, many of these things are um, like serializing signals, et cetera. But what this is, is this is what serializing function closures looks like. And so in this case, we have a function that captures certain lexical scope, the props object. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we actually generate this function at compile time that can pull out this whole use lexical scope was one of the biggest sort of like unlocks to create a lot of the serialization power. This ability for us to sort of pass the lexical scope at runtime as needed, but compile all the other stuff away so that we're still just distributing this little tiny couple lines to still execute with still all the things you expect from just a basic closure, a basic callback function, how it references things outside, how it can manipulate things outside its own scope, stuff like that. I don't know if that was so abstract. It kind of didn't even make sense, but that's the idea <laughs> in case it's- Yeah, a, and I think, I, I mean, I do think that this is, you know, when you start looking into the, the guts of how any framework works, if you're not a hardcore, like JavaScript framework engineer, a lot of this stuff is gonna sound completely opaque and that's okay yeah. what the, heck the reason yeah. we use frameworks is so we don't have to learn this stuff right, <laughs> right? so oh. if if you're if you just listen to that explanation you're like i have no idea what i'm talking about and it started like triggering your panic that you need to learn more you you don't if you want to be a framework engineer sure learn it if you don't want to be a framework engineer and you just want to build stuff for the web isn't it great that people like Steve and Manu and Mishko are building crap like this so that we don't have to deal with it? Like that's that's the joy of frameworks and that's why frameworks exist is that these are hard problems. This this sort of concept of like, can I take a promise, which is, you know, if you try to if you try to console log a promise, you just get like a JavaScript just like no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you if you send a promise across the server client boundary, in most frameworks, you would get nothing. And in and because of the work of, uh, it sounds like Manu, you can just do it now in, in quick and subsequently in Remix and in Solid and so on and so forth. Um, pretty and dang cool. And if it's not obvious, like we should probably take it back to like, what's the benefit? Why, why is this cool stuff matter? The idea is very simple. Let's imagine this component was another, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, hold on. Let me, let me find a stat for you that most people would never want to share. And I'm going to do it because, um, I, I enjoy pain. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you something. We have a react component in our code base in the builder code base that will that loads a lot. It's very commonly used. If you use our platform, you will be using this component a lot. Um, Jason, can you guess how many lines of code our largest React component is? What? 75 lines. No, 750 lines. Oh, it's no, much, two much, lines. Much, <laughs> much, much, much larger. Definitely larger than two. I'll just give you the number. It is 13,449 lines of code. Huh? One React component. Yeah. <laughs> this stuff happens sometimes. It is absurd. It is being broken apart bit by bit. Every time we work on this component, we break things off. But like stuff happens in real world application developments. And so in this case, let's imagine for a moment. And like, honestly, I one thing I hate, I hate, hate, hate it, is when the um, authors of frameworks 
tell you, oh, well, you're doing it wrong. You need to make smaller components. That's that's great. All your docs examples are beautiful. And my code is not. <laughs> that's just how it's going to be because we don't have time to restructure the code every time we have to append something to it. And so the reality is if the guidance is write your code differently, the reality is in many cases, that's not going to happen, at least these, in this idealistic way. I, I do think, yeah, I, I, I also think that like something that always kind of drives me up a wall is the the general approach that when when somebody writes something that they think is very technically impressive and then somebody brings them a very practical reason why they had to do something different or, or why the thing they're doing, they're like, this isn't going to work in my use case or whatever. And the response tends to be like, you're not understanding this correctly. You need to refactor. You need to rewrite like this, this this mm -hmm. implicit expectation that like the world should shape around the brilliant idea. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. this is yes. why so many good, like good ideas die in open source is because people think that the good idea will just cause everybody to drop everything and rebuild everything. Yes. And like, it's not happening. We still got code bases. Like our entire banking system runs on what? COBOL? COBOL! Fortran? Yeah. Something ridiculous yeah, yeah, yeah. like that because there is zero chance <laughs> anybody's going to rewrite the 50 million lines of banking code of because, yeah. you know, React server components have a technically superior idea. It needs to be, there's a much bigger reason that causes those types of code bases to get rewritten. And it's yeah. not like it is more pleasant to work with. <laughs> oh, totally. And if you've ever been involved with one of those projects, one of those like, this is just unmaintainable garbage, just rewrite it. I've never experienced so much pain as a mm. developer because those projects start great and you make 80% of the progress in a few months. And then you spend four years doing the last 20% and it never gets off the ground and it's horrible. It's so horrible for everybody. It starts great and it goes downhill and you live in the, pit of despair for years i i feel projects. like the, this is a it's a, a re like a another way of experience that like well if we could just get rid of those idiots in charge it's like well if we could just get rid of this <laughs> legacy code and yeah, then you exactly. get your greenfield to go rewrite the code and by the time you're done it looks just like the old code base because yes. it turns out people write code for a reason <laughs> exactly exactly 100 exactly what happens the end result cases is are real man would it, like us not wanting to deal with them doesn't mean that they don't exist like eventually you will have to handle that and then and you're going to look back and go, oh, I see why they did that thing the way they did it. It's like it, totally it, expecting that everybody did it wrong because they didn't have your brain is just a surefire ticket to both pain and to realizing that you're actually not as smart as you thought you were. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> and what can happen is you have this mentality of like, well, the prior kind of code was written without respect to the code base. And we should have factored that into when we were delivering the feature. And the reality is, you know, when, when you are the one, you know, we actually do this in our company, a lot of our engineers talk to the customers directly, hear what they need and actually figure out solutions. And when you're face to face with the customer, and if you, if you ever try this, you'll probably only try it once over. If you tell them like, oh, we're not going to do that. Cause that won't look nice in the code base. They're, they have no, <laughs> that does not resonate whatsoever with them. <laughs> what they care about is what they're trying to use your product for. And that you realize through this experience repeatedly that they are correct. Your code base is not correct. And, you know, we try to find the balance. And in this case, like this example, this 13,000 line of code react component, if that was here in quick, that massive component, and all we did was click on that one button. That tiny little code snippet we see there is still all that would execute on the client. I don't care if you wrote 13,000 lines, that's still all you're going to see executed at this time. And in many cases, downloaded too. And that's the beauty. In fact, one person wrote in the chat, in Elm, large files are a virtue. And I'll be honest, there are many cases where if you ignore the um, performance drawbacks that most frameworks have with large files, and you you accept, let's take one extreme, SolidJS, um, SolidJS, if I, if I, I've never actually thought about it specifically this way, but if I understand, you know, deeply how the reactivity works in SolidJS, besides that there's hydration, if we ignore that for a second, there's no runtime penalty to a massive component because everything is granular signal. So it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. You're never rerunning and re diffing in React. There's, there's quite a steep penalty, at least, I mean, 30,000, 13,000 lines. Of course the team would say, sure. don't do that. And I would say, don't do that too. But it's nice sometimes when your framework says, that's fine. <laughs> Refactor it when you need to, not when you have to. Right, and yeah. And, to. and and really anything we're doing is is just us like we're we're writing abstractions over the fact that this is all gonna get unrolled into one giant file anyways when it's executed on totally. the on the browser. So like right. at a certain point we're we're just making our lives harder by 
you know, taking a little thing and moving it out because it, it doesn't look right. It's like, yes. uh, you know, it's okay to put a function inside a function if yes. that's the only place it gets used. It, it's okay. Like you don't need the, the aesthetics are not the point. Um, Cause like, you know, we always said, well, code is a source of truth. Sure, code is a source of truth, but the truth is whether or not the people who use the software find it valuable. Exactly. And that's yes. it. Like you could write the most beautiful code in the world and if it's the source of truth and then the truth you deliver is that everybody hates your app, you're going to be out of a job. I'm sorry. Like gorgeous code doesn't pay the bills. What pays the bills is people using something and enjoying it. Um, Definitely. So anyways, that, that all being said, as I'm off on a rant here, uh, we are coming close to time. So is there anything else you want to cover uh, or should we just start looking at like next steps for people who want to go further on their own? Good question. I think we covered a lot of the important basics. Um, let's definitely talk next steps because I think for those who found even these kind of very thin, very initial steps interesting, there's mm -hmm. a lot more to the framework. We didn't even get to stores and context. Stores are freaking awesome and so many other things. Um, the route loaders, the, oh, the server dollar and the worker dollar. Oh, that needs its own episode or something. The ability to kind of send things to the server. In fact, actually, why don't we do one last really, really quick thing yeah, just let's do it. to have a ton of fun. Um, let us, let's go to your counter components and I'm trying to think of where we want to do this. Um, what I'd love to do is call a function on the server or server code from the client and show how stupidly easy this is. Maybe we could just add another button and we'll just do like an alert of like the current date or something and the date okay. will actually come from the server so if you want to put it wherever you want if you want to add like a fragment around this component add another button or somewhere else add it in the wrapper whatever you think is kind of easiest yeah this is fine yeah. we'll, we'll go for time um yeah. so we've got this one here and then we're gonna have another button uh we're, we'll have an on click that i yes. or actually you know what i'm not even gonna do that yet i'm just gonna go here um yep. get the server date Yes. Okay. So now we've got a button to click to do it. Yes. I assume and I'm going to want to be in here for this. Yes. Yeah. Log in be a good idea. Cool. So let's add an on click. And just remember, on click ends with a dollar in quick lands. TypeScript's always your friend. There you go. And let's have it, let's say like const time equals await server dollar. Okay. There so let go. me make this async. Yes. And mm, server imports. dollar, you can import. Yeah, do you have an auto importer doodad? What the hell? No, that's not no. what I wanted at all. Oh, uh, we may. Do we need to import this from Quick City? I'm not sure. I was just done. I mean, I don't know if server dollar works in the Azure integration. It might. It might not. Server dollar it's in It's not there. part of it, doesn't look like. Try NPM installing Quick City and importing server dollar. Yes. Okay. What's the. Is it builder? Uh, yes, add builder.io slash quick dash city. Yeah, Jack saying serve dollars a quick city API. Um, Jack, can you say in the comments, will it work in the Azure integration? If it doesn't, we can add that in the future. Um, if he knows it doesn't work, we don't have to spend the time. Though I can show you what the code looks like. The code is very cool. He's saying use it. task. Yeah, we can do tasks. Um, he is right. We could do this with TAC, but server dollar is way cooler. Let's show what server dollar <laughs> looks like. If it's not in the Azure okay. integration yet, we can be optimistic that it'll come at 1.0 or soon. But um, so add a callback function to server dollar. There we go. Okay, beautiful. It's add a callback function. And if it surprise works, that's super awesome. But we'll see. <laughs> and cool. And now we can return. I mean, we could return like date.now or something. You know, it would be really cool to return a server specific API. So you could, you, you know, use a Node.js, you know, import something. But we'll do this. Wait, what and, if uh, we use. Uh... Yeah, th this is fine. Let's let's start here, um, and then we're yeah. gonna return time. Yeah, let's do that. Or rather, right, actually, maybe. return will do nothing. Let's console log it, alert it, whatever. Console log. Okay, saving. Okay, Jack saying it won't work. I still there's a still tiny chance that it does. Error yeah, occurred. Yes, I'm happy. Okay, so let's look at the code though. Let's ignore the fact that this doesn't work in the Astro integration. It does work with Quick City, and Jack is saying like. Let's bring it over to the Azure integration. So that's good to hear. But what this is, is if you're familiar with like React server components or how any other framework handles this client server boundary, it's very much like server land is over here in this file, client lands over here in this file, and Quick is all about granularity. So if you actually write something and you just want a piece from the server, 
that server dollar. Or if you've seen um, Bling by Ryan Carneone and Tanner Lindsley, this was actually kind of taking this concept and trying to make it one step more generic to work with SolidJS and some others. Um, but it's freaking cool. Basically, it's this idea that if you want to call code on the server, you can do it anywhere. And that serialization technology that identifies the dollar and that whatever you put in the dollar can transfer over the wire, it actually can work forwards and backwards. So server to client and client back to server. In this case, if you looked at the code that the comp compilation output gave you, which it's probably not easy to do here, what you'd actually see is that when you run that server dollar, it's actually making an HTTP call to the server. And the server is that code's only running on the server. It, it's ripped out by the compiler, it executes server side only. And so anytime, and this is kind of related to the points we were talking about, this idea that you need to re-architect your code because now you need a server call or now you need a server something or a client something or you know React server components, you build a server component, I need client, now you're refactoring components. Mm -hmm. We very much know that that is something that people don't always have time to do. And right. being able to go back and forth is kind of the dream. I'm I'm building out server first, but then I have client event handlers, and I'm in a client event handler, and I need to call my server again. I don't want to make all these HTTP wrapper layers. That's kind of the dream. Other frameworks are trying to kind of piecemeal implement this, but they do it at the module level as opposed to these kind of closure levels. Right. Still, it's unique. This closure bit is is. Um, uh, it's unique to quick and anyway i'll pause there but yeah that's an exciting thing and it also works with workers worker dollar will execute on a worker expensive stuff even if it imports if this imported moment.js moment would mm -hmm. only run on the server or only in the worker in those cases and that's a really cool thing to consider because something like moment is huge and not having to download that on the on the client side is a that's a big win um, so, you know, lets you make better, it just lets you make more informed choices about what, what your code is doing and weigh the trade-offs of like, do I want to do this work on the server? Do I want to do this work on the client and not have to think about like, is this a used server file? Is this a used client file? Is this a something, so, do I have to write an API endpoint and, and so on and so forth. So I know we're almost out of time. Where else should people go if they want to learn more? Yeah, I would say check out. Go to quick.dev and search for the Astro integration. Astro integration is on our docs because I think because it's not maintained by the Astro team, it won't show up directly in the Astro docs. So you go in here, you can search the docs for Astro. You can even just Google um, quick Astro. And there you go. That's the getting started. It'll walk you through, install the package, add the tsconfig, and just start writing quick inside of Astro. Add magic HTML to your HTML first framework. And it's, it's really cool. And I would love to see what people build. I imagine you'd see some. I think what we'll see off of this and I'm excited about is more, I would call like rich Astro sites that fully maintain that performance. There's some mm -hmm. really cool quick sites out there that use, we didn't even talk about visible tasks, like how it makes animations crazy fast, especially like scroll based mm. animations, all stuff to learn separately, but you can bring all that to Astro now and I think it'll be lead to really cool stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna drop a, uh, a link to the the quick docs. So if you do wanna dig in and, and see all that, and then make sure you take advantage of the community. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of people building cool stuff. I know that your team is hanging out on Discord, right? Um, That's correct, and a whole bunch of great community members, and some we call our quick heroes. They are community members who are awesome, killer, they contribute, they answer questions. It's, it's an amazing ecosystem. Excellent. Well. Uh, so I know, yeah, I know that we are, we're basically out of time here. So I'm going to take this opportunity to just do a, another quick thank you to our sponsors, Netlify, Vetsu Code, make this episode possible. It has been live. looks like I got a bug. Uh, looks, it's been live captioned. We've had Amanda here from White Coat Captioning all day. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for being here. One more link to your Twitter profile. And then I think... I think that I'm going to call this one like a, a raging. I had a blast. Did you have fun? Super fun. <laughs> really appreciate this. This is awesome. All right. Well, chat, I hope you had fun as well. And make sure while you're checking out things on the site, you go and look at the schedule because we got a lot of fun coming up, including a very special episode next week that's going to be live in studio. So make sure you mark your calendars and, uh, and show up for that one. Otherwise, I think that's it. We'll see you next time, y'all. Thank you so much for hanging out. I love it. Thanks, everybody.